Hello there, welcome back. This is Brian Buchanan. This tutorial is on basic critical care echo views. We have distilled down the essential bits of information that will better enable you to perform a focused bedside critical care echo. I put in some references here that are highly cited. This first one is from ACCP or the American College of Chest Physicians. So essentially what we want to focus on is these key areas. From echocardiographic patterns, global LV size, systolic function, differentiating homogeneous versus heterogeneous function, contraction patterns, patterns, and so on, as you can see below. This document from Gabriel Vieral is an international and evidence-based recommendations, which is also a useful document to resource. The perioperative interactive education group in Toronto also has some very useful iPad and iPhone apps that can help you understand views and anatomy, and they are simply excellent. Perhaps you're looking for the cause of a patient with, with cardiopulmonary deterioration. Maybe your patient has life-threatening hypoxemia of undifferentiated origin, and it's 3 a.m. There are numerous causes of cardiac and respiratory deterioration, and they serve as compelling arguments for why bedside critical care echo is an asset in managing critically ill patients. Bedside echo is arguably one of the hardest skills to master in CCUS, yet one with the greatest potential to detect and intervene on life-threatening issues. It may allow you to narrow the differential diagnosis, eliminate life-threatening alternatives, or even build a more compelling argument for urgent consultative referral. Our patients are increasingly complex with numerous comorbidities and reversible etiologies of shock and our cardiac arrest, which can readily escape even the most critical of eyes. To start the discussion, though, I want to mention one thing. The goal of learning basic critical care echo is not to replace services of cardiology, but to add to your toolkit. In fact, when used judiciously, the outcome can be, be to build relationships when you call a cardiologist at 4 a.m. and break down a compelling narrative for the diagnosis of tamponade from clinical to echocardiographic data. You will recall the screen marker is screen right, and the depth should ideally start around 16 to 18 centimeters for the parasitic long axis and then reduce this depth to really enhance the screen real estate. Also recall that really when we talk about 2D echo, we're really talking about a two-dimensional cross-sectional technique, which makes a slice through one imaging plane. Hence, the person along axis is really a two-dimensional slice through the long, longest axis of the left ventricle. In this sense, visuospatial learning is the key to understanding this technique. I would encourage you to review probe handling techniques, as these become even more critical when speaking of cardiac imaging. You will make use of 2D or brightness mode imaging, occasionally M mode imaging, and also color Doppler for assessment of valvular regurgitation. Patient positioning is key. In the echo lab, technologists have the luxury of putting patients in left flat of the cubitus. This brings the heart close to the chest wall and maximizes the contact for imaging. In fact, echo lab beds have a dropout section that allows the technologist to swing the probe all the way around the chest. In the ICU, we are less lucky. We may get partial left to cubitus. But even this can sometimes even help. In many cases, the patient will be supine. Nonetheless, you can still obtain these views with some slight manipulation. And really, if you can't move them, don't panic. In many cases, patients can have fantastic windows, despite your intuition, or may just have a great subcostal window, which you really have to make the most of. The full echo repertoire has about 15 views. Many of these views are simply changes in the cross-sectional angle. And if you understand the 2D planar cuts, you can understand why these views are really just derivations of the five core views. Just five views to maximize the yield of information and to detect gross pathology. To cover some basic rules of cardiac imaging, I'd like to highlight these. Move the probe slowly. As most people who begin looking at the heart with ultrasound, generally move the probe like a joystick when you really should stick to one type of probe movement. So move the probe in one direction or axis. Be careful in the ribs. They actually really hurt. You may get the best image perched on a rib looking over. So I would encourage you to, to use lots of gel and a very gentle hand to optimize your imaging. Positioning can help patient a lot. I would encourage you to put the patient even in a small amount of left cubitus, which can help the peristernal imaging greatly. But if you're in a pinch, exploit the best window and be opportunistic like you would in cardiac arrest in obtaining a subcostal four chamber. Let's go over these five acoustic views, or windows, in real time to make sense of them. The first image is a parasitic long axis, the third or fourth intercostal space, with the probe marker facing the right shoulder as directed here. You will obtain the parasternal long axis through the left ventricle. Here we can see a high quality parasitic long axis in the bottom right. You can see the pericardium, descending thoracic aorta, left atrium, mitral valve, left ventricle, outflow tract, aortic valve, aortic root, and right ventricular outflow tract. The mitral valve should 
roughly fall in the middle of the screen, as this is the ideal person along axis angle. We do not use this view to look at the apex, as you really never reach it from this angle. Often you must keep as close as you can to the sternum as possible to obtain this high quality view. And you will often find at first you often slide away from the sternum. A helpful rule of proportions in this view is to compare the RVOT aortic root in left atrium. This is called a rule of thirds. Each should roughly take about a third of the overall space. Any increase in this ratio may be seen in left atrial enlargement, aortic root enlargement, or RV enlargement. This serves as a gross rule without rigorous measurement to help maybe direct you towards a possible cause of patient deterioration. Moving on to personal short axis. This clip demonstrates how to move the probe. You can see rotating from the person along around 60 to 90 degrees with the probe marker now facing the patient's left shoulder. Again, the patient's left shoulder as shown here. In this case, the planar beam now cuts through the short axis of the left ventricle. In this case, you should see the full thickness of the LV all the way around. There are several different levels of the LV you can look at, which can correspond to coronary wall territories, but we are more concerned with global function. In this case, we require some fanning or a sweep to get at the level of the papillary muscles, or in fact a sweep moving laterally to get at the level of papillary muscles. You can also see the crescentic shape of the RV as it wraps around the LV here. Notice the septum is convex towards the RV in its normal configuration. We can also see the endocardial resolution quite clearly. As I mentioned, sometimes you can sweep towards the LV apex, which means the probe literally moves away from the sternum. Sometimes the cardiac chest wall contact is better as the probe moves more laterally. But I should note that in most cases, if you're peristernal left, obtaining a short axis, you can just fan the probe to obtain the same different levels. Moving on to the apical four chamber. If you palpate for the apical impulse, you may find the true apex here. Not always. This is usually a little inferior and lateral to where the anatomical nipple should be. This is the hardest of all windows, so expect yourself to struggle at first. If your patient is in left lateral decubitus, this apex will shift laterally and be found more towards the axilla. This can be quite challenging in an ICU bed. And again, may have to make do with what you have. You can see it here with the promarker facing the bed and just inferior to the, to the nipple line this is a classic anatomical area where you may obtain an apical forechamber, especially in a supine patient. Here's an actual apical forechamber, left atrium, mitral valve, LV, RA, tricuspid valve, and right ventricle. The pericardium also surrounds all four chambers and is seen much more easily in the presence of an effusion. This again is a key window to assess LV, RV function in the presence of tamponade or massive structural abnormalities. Be careful to obtain your apical forechamber with long axis through the LV apex, or your view will be foreshortened, which means you will alter the appearance of your left ventricle and right ventricle. Often the apical forechamber will look more spherical. In this case, image B on the right corresponds to the foreshortened view, where the imaging plane cuts through just below the apex. Moving on to the inferior vena cava, this view is obtained just below the ziphi sternum to the right of midline. The probe should be pointed towards the head, or cephalad, with the planar cut following the parasagittal or sagittal plane. I will start gentle with this one, as it often doesn't require a lot of pressure, just some finessing. As you can see here, some gentle pressure is applied just below the ziphi sternum to obtain this view, often with some gentle rocking, looking upwards with the tail falling downwards, you will easily see the entrance of the IVC into the RA. As shown here, you can see the IVC coursing beside the liver into the right atrium. In this case, to properly identify the IVC, you should see the hepatic vein, which is perpendicular to the IVC. You should also see the IVC right junction and recognize that the IVC is juxtahepatic, surrounded by liver texture. The aorta and does not connect the right atrium and is often surrounded by hyperchoic mixed density fat. Moving on to one of the most essential views in critical care, the subcostal forechamber view. This is the, essentially the subcostal version of the apical forechamber. The probe marker facing the patient's left side, the probe is simultaneously depressed and fanned to yield the correct plane, as shown here. Again, in this case, the probe marker is facing towards us. Here we can see the pericardium, right atrium and right ventricle, most anterior. The left atrium and left ventricle are seen in the far field. This view, again, is often the most easiest and practical to obtain a critically ill patient who is severely unstable. 
You can make a slight derivation of this view and move the probe 90 degrees counterclockwise to review a subcostal short axis. Again, if all you have is a subcostal view, this can be really essential to add more information. This is essentially the same sagittal plane as the IVC, but fanned towards the patient's left or towards the heart. Here we can see the subcostal short axis. Again, which is quite informative, this is the only view you have. Well, that's it. I would encourage you to review this lecture at any time. It is a lot of information. It will require some obviously complimentary hands-on teaching and further discussion.